going to go ahead and introduce our packers. And if they just raise their hand and give a wave, um, presenting an overview of the types of pack saddles is Eric Corditz, animal packer on the Shasta Trinity National Forest at Weavervale Ranger District. And he's not able to be with us live today. And Doug Hunt, who is a retired Forest Service lead packer from the Selway Bitterroot Wilderness yeah. on the Nez Perce Forest. And again, he's not with us. But with us today, looking at the Salmon River pack saddle is Ken Graves, the animal packer on the Shasta Trinity National Forest and co-director of the Pacific Southwest Center of Excellence. Katie Bartzokas, one of two lead animal packers at the Center of Excellence, also working on the Shasta Trinity National Forest. And you will also see in the video, Eric Cordes, animal packer on the Shasta Trinity, as we said. Presenting the Sawbuck Pack Saddle is Michael Morse. He's the Wilderness and Trails Program Manager on the Inyo National Forest and co-director of the Pacific Southwest Center of Excellence. And Deb McNoob, Special Uses Administrator and Stock Program Manager on the Sierra National Forest and Pacific Southwest Center of Excellence. She's also the Education Chair there. So with that, we're gonna go ahead and launch the first video. And we're gonna look at an overview with Eric of the three types of pack saddles. So we're talking about the three different primary types of pack saddles you'll find in the Western US. And so you'll see in different locations, different areas, one or the other is the predominant thing that commercially you'd be using. And it's really a location dependent thing. Uh, the double rig sawbuck like this, more popular in the Southern Rockies, all over the Sierras in the California area. Uh, you'll see this Salmon River style sawbuck really only in Northern California, and that's going to be pretty much the Trinity and Siskiyou Mountains. And then the Decker, uh, more predominant in the Northwest and Northern Rockies. But again, you may see any of them anywhere. Um, that's just kind of where they all originated and where they became the most popular. So a few little uh, details about all of them. I will start with this double rig sawbuck, uh, again, common in the Sierras and the Southern Rockies, but found pretty well all over. Uh, you'll notice it's rigged with two rings, so it has a cinch that goes along with that. And this double cinch, nice wide um, weight distribution underneath the animal. Uh, it ties twice, leather breast collar and a leather britching. Uh, you won't have a rope affixed to that saddle, but you'll always use a lash rope. And actually as it is with all three of these, you'll often use a lash rope. Uh, another thing about the Sierra type that you'll find is a lot of times there'll be some sort of a side pad or half breed, depending on what it is, that goes over the top after you uh, cinch it on. This just adds a little protection to the animal. Um, there's different types. Some don't have a board, rather just a pad. Uh, it just depends on, on what you're doing and where you're at, but that's the way that typically would work. A uh, couple advantages of it, uh, or perceived advantages anyway, it's a little bit lighter. Um, to rig up on the animal, especially because the side pad isn't part of it and you put that on later. Uh, but we weighed all of these and a bunch of different other models of the same types we have in the barn here. And to really be honest with you, the weight difference between the lightest and the heaviest of any of them is always around five pounds. So uh, the Salmon River typically runs to the heavier end, this to the lighter end. Uh, but again, five pounds or so is really not a critical weight. Uh, so the way you'll hitch on these, a lot of times panniers will be hung on and um, box hitch or diamond hitch is the most common, but whatever type of lash rope you'll throw on there. So that's, that's that. Uh, another similarity you'll see between all three of these saddles, they all look different, but they all, it's easier to see on this one, they all carry the weight on the mule's back with a set of bars just like this. This tree, that tree, and the Decker tree all really essentially have the same set of bars underneath them. And so really one of the most critical things, whatever saddle you're using, if these bars fit your animals, you're in good shape. If they don't, it, it doesn't make a difference what you're using, it's not gonna work. So that's a critical component on any of these that that is shaped in a way that fits your animal well. So the Salmon River Sawbuck, a um, little bit different variety, similar tree, quite a bit different saddle. Uh, you see it's got a lot more canvas on it, the breast collar and this double bridge and trooper combination have quite a bit of canvas in them. It makes them a little bit lighter. They're also often used in pretty hot country, so it might help with uh, breathability. Just makes them a little bit easier on the animal. Then we have the rigging on the outside, the single rig right here. Here's the cinch. Uh, this rope is tied in the middle onto the front fork. It's about 
60 feet long before you tie it on there. So you really have a similar uh, sling rope here and in the decker in that they're 25 or 30 feet long on either side. Um, but this is a single rope tied in the middle. One of the key things about the Salmon River saddle is what's found underneath here. Uh, called an aparejo um, from the Spanish or Central American uh, Mexican area where they used this type of pack saddle with no tree in it historically for a long time. At some point in the western United States mining country up here in Northern California, they realized that the combination between a hard pack tree and that aparejo was the best way to carry heavy awkward loads to protect the animal, get the loads in safe. Uh, the single rig is pretty easy on them and it's real easy to adjust with these um, adjustable holes you just move that back and forth the ring will slide this way that way if you're having the sore develop different shapes of animals you can easily accommodate that uh, the other real key factor is this double bridge and a breast collar um, sorry crouper and bridging uh, that really provides a lot more um, hold on the on the animal uh, the crouper under the tail of course uh, but you're also touching the hip in a couple places here as well as lower here so no matter where that animal's moving or what he's doing, that Britchin trooper is going to have a good hold on him. It really helps holding those loads back. And they don't swerve the animals. We have really uh, good luck with that. And that's the saddle we use the most here. Uh, and that's one of the things we like about it. Uh, this saddle, again, would be typically just a few pounds heavier, but within about five of all these other outfits. Uh, you'll also have a hard time finding these to buy. There's a saddle maker here and there that makes one really None of the people that make them are actually saddle makers by trade, though. Mostly they're just packers who needed to get them, figured out how to make them, and now they sell them. Uh, so it's more expensive and it's not easy to locate. So that's probably the, really the only big disadvantage to this saddle that I can think of from our experience with them is just obtaining them. And if you have the ability to make them and fix them yourself, uh, if we do that here, that makes it really pretty easy to deal with. If you don't, it's going to be a little tougher. And so. Here's our third decker, um, traditional decker with the round hoops on top. They also have a modified type, which has more of a bell shape on top, and that allows you to just hang a pannier over it. Uh, kind of built to pack in a little bit different way. Sling ropes, again, used uh, tied off in the front. You'll find uh, a lot of decker loads are manied loads, and you can make a big load and sling it on there, and they ride pretty good. Um, for certain parts of the country, it's a good saddle and really ideal, maybe in that terrain. Uh, those big loads can be a little tougher in thick brush, uh, tight quarters, and so it kind of depends on, on your area. But, uh, again, this is similar in some ways to the sawbuck rigging with a single leather breast collar and spider and britching right here. Um, again, though, also some differences, a single rig on the outside, uh, something like the Salmon River. It's also adjustable. And there's a couple ways they build these to adjust. This one has the buckles in here. All you do is raise and lower those accordingly, and it'll move this ring back and forth where you want it. Uh, some have a Conway buckle built in on the outside, but it's the same thing and really does the same function. And so uh, weight-wise, it's going to be somewhere in the middle of these two. It comes in just pretty much a couple pounds different than the Salmon River. Um, pretty durable. Uh, some folks like the fact you could adjust those bars by heating them up and opening and closing them a little bit to fit different animals, and that could be an advantage. If you want to adjust these bars to fit, or these bars to fit, you have to get a wood rasp out. If they've already been made, you're not really going to change that angle, so um, just have to remove material to give a good relief where you need it. Um, but any of these can be modified to fit your animals a little bit better. And so that's a basic overview, uh, three different pack saddles. Uh, not too different in weight, pretty similar in style of how you pack them in some ways, um, quite a bit different in other ways. Uh, you'll find that any of them can work well, any of them can keep an animal from getting hurt and get the load in. Uh, whatever uh, preferences are, are regional probably has a lot to do with what worked better at some point in time there at that region. So uh, if one of these is popular in your area, you might look into why and may find that there's some advantages there. Uh, but that's a basic overview of this. Great. Well, thanks to Eric um, from the Weaver Weaverville Ranger District, and he's not with us today for that really good overview. And we'll start by looking at the um, Decker saddle.
And this is with Doug Hunt. He's a retired Forest Service packer from the Northern region, packed in the Selway Bitterroot Wilderness. Hello, I'm here today to talk to you about the Decker Pack Saddle, the history and why it's the preferred saddle of the Northern region. My name is Doug Hunt. I'm retired Forest Service. I was a packer from 1989 to 2005. I'm gonna start with the history of the saddle. The Decker Pack Saddle came in about 1906. Originally, there was a gentleman named Moore that invented a steel hoop pack saddle in the late 1860s. And he made it for the US Army. They wanted to try something different. They used it for a while and it didn't work out. So they accessed it, they put it out uh, for surplus and actually by 1899, the saddle was sold at New York at uh, big stores. And then in 1906, uh, O.P. Robinette, who was the packer and packmaster for the Selway Forest, it wasn't the Nez Perce at that time, it was the Selway Forest. He started working with uh, a steel hoop. He had three quarter inch iron hoops and made the wooden bars. Basically what he did, he just went and found uh, what he thought was a mule with the average back. And he whittled down the bars, put the steel hoops on there, and then fit the saddles to each individual mule. This is one of the original OPR bars. And this has been worked down. So I don't know what they actually, I've never seen one that was not worked down but you can see the shape of them. They're, they're uh, shaped for the withers, they're kind of concave. And uh, so anyway, each individual animal would get fitted. He would fit it to the back and then build a saddle around it. And it would go out to the packers and the forest service. So actually the Selway National Forest is the original, is where the original Decker came from. Now there was a lot of packers at that time in that country. Idaho had a lot of mining, big heavy loads that they needed to get in the back country. A lot of packers were experimenting with uh, different saddles, trying to make a saddle that fit a mule that could carry more tonnage into the back country without galling them up. The first original saddles like Moore made and everything were really crude. They had no, uh, really attempt to fit an animal. They weren't, weren't right. So anyway, uh, getting back to it. So, uh, uh, OP Robinette kind of fed off of everybody. All the other packers came up with the Decker pack saddle. And, uh, then the Decker brothers out of Kuski and Riggins, who actually ran some really huge strings back in the breaks of the salmon for uh, the mining. They came up with the half, this is the half read right here. OP uh, Robinette saddles did not have a half read. And with the heavy loads, the Decker brothers developed this type of half read. It's heavy canvas and then it was stuffed with horse hair, bear grass. Now it's stuffed with a rubberized hog hair. And anyway, so uh, the Decker brothers started using OPRs, saddles, and so did the other packers in that region. And then the Deckers actually went to Robinette and asked them, asked him if they could uh, sell their saddles, if they could uh, uh, mass produce them. And he, or he not mass produce them, but he would, he would supply the saddles or the trees. And they, and he said, sure. So the Decker brothers actually got the name for it, not OPR, but every saddle that OPR made, he marked with the OPR brand. So, you know, you can see there's another one here that looks real similar, no brand on it, no OPR. So he did not make this in his career. He actually quit the Forest Service in 1926 and went to full-time saddles. And when he uh, died in 1946, he had made 12,000, er, between 12 and 13,000 saddles. I'm going to move on to the new modern trees that if you folks are looking for uh, deckers to buy for your district, this is more of what you're going to find. 
The saddle here is one that's more mass produced now. You can see it's a little bit different. Uh, the hoops are, it still has a three quarter inch hoops. You can see the difference though in the trees are a little more refined. They're thick so that when you put this on a mule's back, you can actually, uh, and press down, you can actually see how much contact you have. You you want 100% contact, that's, that's ideal. And by doing that, you have to take a rasp uh, and rasp this area down. Now, a lot of folks, they'll do, if you do this a lot, you don't need to do the pancake flour thing, but a lot of people will put uh, pancake spread uh, flour or pancake on the back of the mule's back, wet the bars down, and then set this on the mule's back and press down, lift it up. And you'll see actually where the, the uh, pancake mix or flour is, that's your contact. Wherever it's not and you have bare wood, there's no contact. So what you might do is rasp this down, keep doing that until you have 100% contact. Okay, with that being said, now I'm just gonna do a little bit on the fitting of the saddle and why the Decker is so versatile and why it's so popular and I think kind of uh, hands above the other ones. And that's the adjustment. It's quick and easy to adjust when you're in the Salmon River country, Hell's Canyon, the Selway. Uh, there's a lot of times that you're, it's steep, you're going downhill, you may have to get off your horse and adjust the britch and breast collar, tighten it up, loosen it up, uh, if you really care about your animals. So you have these buckles right here. Uh, is your rigging buckles for this, that's for these two and they go in here and around the hoops and this is fully adjustable so that when you fit it to the animal around the girth animals are shaped different just like people and you got to get you know the right spot in the girth otherwise you gall them give them sores again this is back where your spider goes your hip pad when we get over here to flow uh, i'll do it real quick on on how this is so adjustable so quick and the real advantage of the decker pack saddle I'm going to move over here to Flo and just talk a little bit about the adjustment and the advantage of the Decker pack saddle. This is Flo. She's a retired Forest Service mule. We packed together since 1993. When they retired her, I got her. I got her full sister as well. So we're uh, we're both old and uh, don't do a whole lot. Anyway, uh, again on the adjustment, I told you the uh, uh, straps over there on the tree. This is what I was talking about. You can move this cinch forward or back to get it in the right spot so you don't gall the animal. If you're not an experienced packer, uh, adjusting saddles, this may take a little bit. You may uh, soar up your animal a little bit, so it's all an experience. Uh, your straps here, you can raise and lower your breast collar. You want to keep it off the point of the shoulder. You want about a hand's width. Uh, in there to give her room. Uh, the uh, spider back here, this is the spider. Hip pad, the hip pad should be back on the hip. Come down to the bridge in, and again, you know, uh, I think this is a pretty good place, but uh, you may want to lower it, raise it to your preference. The animal curves right here a little bit, so you want it, you don't want it straight. You kind of want to keep that with the, the contour of the animal's rump so that they don't wear. And your straps, you want enough room back here. As this uh, gets hot uh, and you're using, the, it does stretch out some. So you want enough room to get a full stride uh, front and back. And again, uh, it just takes some adjustment and uh, uh, keep keep looking at things, you know, just, just be uh, noticing. And so I'm gonna kind of just show you what I think is the real advantage of the Decker, uh, you don't have to use the uh, diamond hitch. And probably the most uh, common uh, uh, sling is just a basket hitch. And this is one that most everybody uses. And so you put it on the animal's back. Roughly about right there uh, from the top. You want it roughly right there, about in the center of the ring, so that when the other side peeks out, they peek out about the same. Get your rope tight.
come back here with your rope. Uh, a lot of people, you have different preference. A lot of people have a preference on how long their swing ropes are. I like uh, about 26 feet. This one's probably 30 something. Put a half hitch there and secure it. Now the thing about this is where when you're using the uh, Sawbuck Salmon River, well, the Salmon River uses swing uh, swing ropes too, but uh, you don't do the uh, diamond hitch on that. When you use the diamond hitch, the the load, the mule goes with the load. This right here, if you're in tight area, it swings up kind of out of the way and it keeps going. These are light, so they don't swing down. But you can see they swing up and then come back down. Whereas uh, the diamond hitch, if you get in a bad spot, you're in a tight area, and uh, the mule is going to go where the load goes. It's tied on solid. Where these also, if the mule starts rolling or something, these will pro these will most likely uh, uh, come loose. And this is just one hitch. I'm not going to get into packing. There's other people that are going to do that. I'm just doing the decker. This is one of the reasons why we use the decker. And again, it was developed on the Selway uh, forest and uh, that's it. It stayed and it's a great saddle. Thank you. Thanks, Doug. Some great history there on the Decker pack saddle. And now we're going to move on and learn a lot more about the Salmon River saddle that you've seen. And you'll see the packers Ken and Katie and Eric in this video. Shasta Trinity and Forest. Been a packer here since 1977. Still going at it. Be careful what job you take. Uh, it was supposed to be a summer job packing to the lookout, supplies to the lookout, and I'm here about 40 plus years later. This is a, a quick deal here on the Salmon River saddle. Uh, we were lucky enough to get, get a bunch of new ones a while back, so we got pretty nice gear here to show you. So this is a traditional Salmon River pack saddle, Salmon River Sawbuck, we call it. Uh, really not a common saddle, it's only in use these days, uh, primarily in Northern California, the Trinity and Siskiyou Mountains. So that'd be from the town of Red Bluff, north to the Oregon border, more or less. Historically, it's been around long enough. Some of the details aren't real clear, but it was the common saddle here for sure in the mining days. And that's why it became more common with with the Forest Service and uh, all the outfitters here as well. And still among professional packers in this area, this is more often the saddle you see. Uh, so it's different than either your normal double rig sawbuck that you're probably used to seeing or the Decker. Um, some similarities, it kind of looks like a hybrid of those two, but it's if, if anything, it's been around as long as, as the other sawbuck. Uh, definitely not um, uh, taken from those as much as it is from the Spanish Aparejo pack saddle. And you can see uh, that's underneath here. This is really a key element that makes this saddle different than the others. Uh, it's a frame inside, and so it's rigid. It's got wooden sticks on both the bottom and up and down, and those wooden sticks allow you to tie your load right to the saddle as a pack frame, more or less. The rigging being over the outside and those corners allows that to be rock solid, secure hitch. You can get it as tight as a drum, it doesn't come loose. Uh, the outside rigging has also an advantage in that it's a single. It's easy to just move this back and forth a little bit to fit your animal better, or if you have a long trip or a little injury, something starting to show where you're going to have a rub, you can move that and keep your animals working in. That was a popular feature of it in those days. Uh, you also see it's made of lightweight material. It's got a canvas breast collar. Um, this is another real key element of it. From a distance, this is the easiest way to tell if a guy's packing Salmon River saddles. So you have a double Richard and Crouper combination, and uh, the Crouper goes right under the tail. This, of course, rides lower. And what you'll see um, with that in action, uh, demonstrated later, is that it really helps hold that load not only from going forward, but it also helps stabilize it side to side as well. 
So when you have this on the animal, really what you've got is bridge in the breast collar and this one cinch underneath that you can adjust anywhere you like. And so it really excels at protecting the animal. Uh, this padded Aparejo frame cover really keeps awkward heavy loads off. That's one of the reasons the miners seem to prefer it here in the factories. It's like that. They pack it. Mining equipment, pipe, heavy tools, everything that you needed. There were many towns here that had no access other than the pack train. And so when you get there, uh, their things, they had to get everything in there on pack animals. So this was the way they did it. And uh, so it's a unique saddle. Uh, we find it to be the most advantageous after having used them all. But uh, of course, everybody's got their different opinions on it. But uh, we really like the way it treats the mules and the way it carries the mules. So we're gonna throw the Salmon River saddle on this mule and talk about it a little bit, talk about some of the advantages of it. Um, I'm gonna throw it on the way that I usually on this is the uh one of the huge advantages of this saddle is this britching uh has multiple contacts at one time maybe three contacts at one time going downhill definitely helps hold the loads back pay attention step up step up part here is huge on the protection of the animal for packing heavy mine equipment or whatever or we call it the apparato. Um, there's actual sticks that are in the corners of the saddle and it forms these um, hard corners that we can then grab with our ropes and we suck the load to the saddle rather than sucking the load down to the animal itself. Another difference is that the weight sits a little bit higher on these saddles. Often, you know, we want it to, the weight to kind of be right up here near the fork instead of some of the other styles of packing where the weight's really low, um, which allows the animal to get through some tight spots really well, but also means that if you have a round back mule, it, it's hard to pack a through the river saddle on that. So we're a little more um, selective, I would say, about the kinds of mules that we choose. Salmon River saddles use a combination of sling ropes and lash ropes. The sling rope on the Salmon River saddle is clove hitched to the front fork at its midpoint and is stored by wrapping both ends of the rope around the forks when not in use. Your imagination on how you tie this thing with different hitches is almost the limit because uh, you can do a lot of different things with the saddle. So on the Salmon River saddle, we use a, just a basic sleeve um, called a basket hitch to hold the box on rather than hanging the box from the forks. So I'm just using a basket hitch to hold the box up, um, which is just a little sling. And I tie it by just going over, creating a bite, coming next to it, and pulling it tie the salmon over diamond which is the it's the traditional kind of open diamond um, that is used on these saddles and what makes it a little bit different is that when we come around instead of just catching the corners of the box I'm gonna catch the corner of the saddle itself um, and it's gonna hold this box down to the rigid aparejo that's in the saddle. I'm gonna start by throwing my slack out diagonal across the mule Pass Karen the cinch. Throw out a loop. So 
I'm going to go grab the tail end of this lash rope and bring it up and place it over the mule's neck. We're catching the hook end of the lash cinch. And I'm going to grab this bite of rope that Ellen threw and hook to it. And often when we're in this position, I have more of the lash cinch, so we're going to try to get the cinch centered on her. So I'm going to feed some to Ellen and ask her if she likes it. And that, that little flip right there is what forms the diamond on the top. And um, one of the things that I like about this diamond is even though it doesn't look as tidy as some of the other diamonds that you see, there is at no point that we have to reach around and twist a rope or grab anything through the top. So there's, you can pack a really tall mule with a really tall load. Nice that way. Okay. I'm taking the, the front rope and I'm flipping it back to create the bite in the back rope. And then I'm taking uh, the tail end of the whole lash rope that Karen set across the mule's neck and I'm going under and over my rope. And, and there you have it, the top of the diamond is formed. Okay, and now we're just going to tighten it. Um, Karen's going to pull all the slack out and feed it to my side. You good? Yep. We're going to come to the back. Okay, then I'm going to come to the back and grab this end of the rope and pull out any slack towards the back of the mule. Hook the corner of the saddle in the back. Hook the corner of the saddle in front. Under the corner again. I catch my two ropes and tie off. Coming over. So this is, I guess you'd call it a mobile sawing operation that frequently I do on fires with pack mules and sometimes we have an authorization to use chainsaws for uh, 
certain times, uh, and usually it's a fire. Uh, what this is is just a way to pack everything up in that one load, your whole set of tools, saw pack, wedges, gas, oil, um, PPE. Unpack only what you need to do the job as you're moving along to cut access into a fire where you may have to go. Uh, two years ago, an 18 mile trip, and I probably cut 50 logs on that. And there's other times it'd be different lengths, but you don't have to unpack the whole mule every time. It's fast, it's efficient. You can jump off, get what you need, open it up, and keep moving. And so with one or two people, you can cover a lot of ground this way. And so you can apply the same way I'm doing this with the chainsaw set to the hand tools for normal trail work as well. And uh, we have guys that do that in, in the trail crew here and it works really good for them also. So we'll put it all together and then show you how it works. So the advantage obviously to this isn't really until you get the, a log on the trail you need to cut. So you ride up and the way you set the load up to begin with will determine how easy this can be. Um, set up so that this is the top rope of the two that we tie. The tools I'm likeliest to need most are here, uh, saw, PPE, wedges, axe, and a little oil. Extra fuel and oil, a gallon or two of water, and some other tools that you, you may need eventually in the job are on the other side. And so for the most part, you can just unload it, cut up, and go. So that's what I need to make a cut. If it's a lot of cut and I need more fuel or oil, whatever, it's right there. Once I'm done with that cut, you're ready to get back on and right away. Uh, one thing I would consider sometimes is maybe using a shorter mule when you're really on the trail with this. Brenda, we're coming. Come on, I'll take a little hike.
Okay, again, we're gonna go ahead and transition to a video about with Michael and Deborah and the folks that use the Sawbuck Saddle and see what that one's all about. Hi everyone, my name is Michael Morris and we're here on the Inyo National Forest and we're actually on the Man Ranch, our stock facility that we have down in Bishop, California. And I've got Amy uh, and Abby here with me today. And uh, what we're gonna do today is we're gonna give you a little presentation on the Sawbuck Saddle. The Sawbuck Saddle is pretty much the priority saddle that we use here on the Inyo. Uh, we have a couple others, but this is probably the one we use on a daily basis. Uh, the Sawbuck Saddle is pretty much the main saddle that's used all over the Eastern Sierras, uh, pretty much all over the Sierras, I should say. Uh, all the commercial outfitters and everybody else around here pretty much has been using this one as long as I can remember. Pretty much my whole career I've been using the Sawbuck Saddle. I found it to be a very, very practical saddle. I found it to have a lot of applications in a lot of different situations. I've packed anywhere from uh, 14 foot boards to 55 gallon drums to hose lay for fire crews to uh, MREs. Um, another big thing we pack a lot of is we pack a lot of groceries, a lot of supplies for all of our trail crews. And we're probably going to demonstrate some of that a little bit later. We're going to give you an overview of the different types of equipment we use. But I think to start off with, we're going to talk a little bit about the you know, what the saddle, why it's made the way it is, what the practicality of the saddle is, and how we do apply it to our daily work. Uh, to do that, we're going to invite Lee Roger. He's the master packer from the uh, Pacific, Pacific Southwest Center of Excellence, and also he's the forest packer here on the Inyo National Forest. So I'm going to step aside and let him talk, and I hope you enjoy our presentation today. Well, thank you, Michael. Okay. Um, well, we are uh, uh, honored to uh, actually have a part in this uh, National Wilderness Skills Institute um, presentation today. Uh, what I'd like to talk about right now is the history of the sawbuck. As we said earlier, um, this is a common saddle in the Sierra. Um, it's uh, a lot of the West. It's, it's still um, kind of common pack saddle. Prior to that, you know, as soon, soon as man started uh, domesticating and, and packing animals of all types, it was kind of the sawbuck was the original um, true saddle that was used. In, uh, um, you know, early days, it was a, a saddle that could be put together relatively uh, um, quick and easy. Um, we've gotten a lot more sophisticated, I'd like to think, over time in coming out with a better saddle that is uh, fits the animal better and, and works for our mission. The uh, history uh, with the Forest Service is, is pretty unique in that, you know, 1906, what was the number one pack saddle in the West? It was the Sawbuck. And that's what the, uh, the Forest Service really started with until the development of the Decker saddle. And uh, Anyway, the Sierra is still kind of a stronghold for the, the Sawbuck Saddle. And um, today we're going to kind of talk about some of the applications we still use um, in the Sierra um, with this saddle. Um, and we'll, um, we kind of want to talk about this saddle, but we also want to talk about how we uh, apply it to wilderness management, um, to all the jobs that we do in our wilderness lands. Um, as Michael said, this is a, a traditional saddle for the Sierra. Um, and we do use, um, as Michael said also, we use some Decker saddles also. But um, this is kind of our everyday uh, go-to saddle here. I'd like to kind of talk about just some of the components about it. Um, you know, we, we have breast collars on them, but in the Sierra, typically, um, they're run pretty loose. And we don't want them tight. We want uh, the mules to be able to have all their air when they're going up or jumping up. We don't want, you want a saddle that's going to uh, give you security and support, but we don't want to restrict the animals any more than we have to. One of the components to our system of packing are our pads. That's an uh, important part of it. Uh, you know, we use a, try to use natural uh, fibers. You know, we've got a rollback pad underneath here and a, um, a heavy uh, 
wool felt pad on top and that that is part of the you want to give the animal all the padding you can um, to protect it and let that animal be able to do its job to the best of its ability uh, the shape of the the sawbuck tree is um, paramount to the success of this uh, program uh, the bars um, which this is called the bar um, you want that to be shaped to the animal's back to distribute the weight load of the pack. Um, the other thing that uh, we'll talk about a little bit later is we also put some additional padding on top of all of this. Um, in this system, we use a double rig. Um, however, there's some saw bucks that, you know, people will use a single rig on and they can be very effective also. This unit and harness back here is called the britchen. And basically what that does, it helps hold the saddle from going too far forward. Uh, we don't want the saddle to ride up on the animal's shoulders uh, to restrict their movement or get them sore because there's a lot of shoulder movement in here. So you want to hold that load uh, back in place. And by doing that, uh, we position the saddle back here. <clears throat> this uh, rope here that's attached is called a pigtail. And this is how we tie the animals together. This little cord here that has a breaking strength of maybe only 45, 50 pounds is called a breakaway. The uh, component that um, um, we're going to add to the saddle that we, we always use them together is called a side pad. Just a canvas pad <coughs> that will go over top of the saddle. It does several things. One, it protects the rigging of the saddle. <clears throat> and two, which is probably in my mind maybe a little more important, it helps keep the pack load out away from the animal and up higher. We don't want that load to fall down here and be riding on their rib cage. Um, with that, I think that's just a quick overview of uh, what this system is, and I think our important part is we're going to, um, uh, Michael's going to show you some of the equipment we use and uh, how, how it's packed on the mule, and that's what makes it applicable to um, the, the Forest Service and our mission um, on wilderness land. Hi again. Uh, just like I said previously, what we thought we'd do now is I'd like to show you some examples of all the different type of equipment that we're able to uh, put on the saw buck. And I do really want to focus on one thing. I'm not really going to focus so much on the equipment as far as how it fits the animals as much as I want to focus on the fact that a lot of this equipment is stuff that I believe most wilderness rangers, trails personnel, and a lot of our volunteer groups have been using for the last, I don't know, you know, 30, 40 years as we modernize a little more with better equipment, bear protection equipment, uh, lightweight equipment, which is something new we're going to. So what I want to do is kind of focus a little bit on that as well. I think it's a good opportunity for everybody to see here in uh, the Inyo National Forest and uh, pretty much uh, on one of our more heavily used trails, the John Muir Trail, where we have a lot of bear requirements, we have a lot of cap camping restrictions, and a lot of other things that go on that this is a good way to utilize uh, safe and efficient equipment but also more importantly it's also something that we're able to pack in in the mountains um, first of all i'll give you the fundamentals of what the saw buck has to have in order to be a working saddle um, these are a set of leather bags called panniards or um, pretty much just bags as we call them pack bags but every tool that we use in, in this uh, area of equipment, you'll see one thing that's a very common, and that's what we call the ears on the bag. These ears, these two circular straps here, uh, actually are the ones that actually hang on the side of the mule. And we'll demonstrate that a little bit later when we go to pack a mule. But everything we have here, the bags, the slings, are designed to have this equipment uh, placed in them or wrapped in them so that we can hang them on the side of the mule. It eliminates things as having to pre manny a load. It eliminates things like having to uh, pre-wrap. And also, when you hang them on, you're pretty much to the point there where you can actually put a, 
Manny over the top and tie a hitch. So one of the things I wanted to show you too was that most common to us packing in the backcountry is these leather bags. We use these all the time. Uh, as you can see, there's a green box inside of it. <clears throat> the purpose of the green box is, is for multiple reasons. We're able to put uh, gasoline, fuels, other objects that we want to protect from the mule by having a hard surface inside the bag. So what we've done over here, if you look back here, it's an ideal situation for putting uh, hand tools in. As you can see, the hand tools go out the back of the mule. We're able to pretty much, the mule would be between, between these two uh, uh, bags right here. And we're able to uh, hang them on both sides of the mules and the tools are pointing backwards. Uh, we'll show that later when we actually hang bags on the side. The other thing that we have out here that's really very important to all of our trail crews, all of our volunteers, and all of our backcountry users is we have these uh, approved bear boxes. And these boxes were built uh, here in California after we implemented a uh, requirement that nobody could have any kind of food in the backcountry without bear protection. Uh, we use the Garcia canisters for our wilderness rangers. We use a lot of other uh, types of mechanisms that are approved by the Park Service and the Forest Service for bear protection. This particular one is, is pretty much the common that we uh, have all of our commercial packers, our general uh, users, our, uh, and the Forest Service is pretty much utilizes for all of our uh, volunteer and trail crews. It's kind of unique. It's an aluminum box. It has an aluminum lid, two little screws on the top, and all it takes is just a border or a Leatherman or something to seal it up and it's 100% bear proof and as you can see it comes pre-made with the leather straps again making everything very easy to put on the top of a mule. Um, the other thing that we utilize quite a bit in our camping and our trail crews is we've learned over the years to incorporate these 18 gallon Rubbermaids. Uh, they're ideal for putting all kinds of food protection in there uh, we it's waterproof and the best part of all as you can see it fits right inside our pannier uh, a lot of times what we tell our trail crews is to bring these to uh, to the job site put the heavy goods in the bottom cans and things like that and as you get to the top maybe put in your breads and your protected items but the nice thing about it is it's a one-shot deal you got it all ready drop it in the pan put it in the pannier, hang it on the mule, and you're ready to go. The other thing that we're starting to use a lot in the backcountry, again, going back to bear protection, is we're starting to utilize the Yetis. I know they're a little expensive, but there's also a lot of other uh, companies out there that are making similar ice chests. But the part that we like is right here on the corner is a little locking latch and that's where you're able to seal the ice chest up again for bear protection or from somebody else getting into your food whichever you want to use it for <laughs> uh, so everything again that we have here is pretty much designed to be pre-made up on the ground in our facility we can put them on scales weigh them all out when we get to the job site we get to the trailhead because 90 percent of our packing is always at trailheads we're able to take this stuff right off the back of a pickup truck, hang it on the side of the mule, and um, many our loads, and away we well, go. Well, here we are. We're with uh, Abby the mule. So the plan here is pretty much to show you how all that equipment that I talked about a little bit ago, how it's going to fit here on this mule. Uh, so as we go through this process, we'll kind of give you a little idea of what we're doing, and we're going to get started right now. So the first thing we're going to do is, like I said earlier, we're going to take these ears and those ears are going to fit right over the top of the mule on the saw buck. I'll hold this side up a little bit just to kind of keep the weight off the mule until Lee gets to his load on the other side. As I said earlier, everything we do is pretty much designed to be done, put on these mules just like this. We don't really do any side loads or manning. All of our uh, equipment is pretty much designed to hang, put a manual uh, tarp on it and go. So, uh, this is a 
good example of how we generally pack all the red bags for the firefighters. And down below, we probably have their food and the groceries coming over. That canola strap helps secure the load on top of the mules. We're always looking for every way that we can think of to make things a little bit safer. I think, uh, what do you think, Lee? We're going to tie a diamond on this one? Well, let's tie a diamond on this okay, one. Okay, we? Do you have anything to say about the diamond hitch, Lee? Pardon? Do you have any comments you want to make about the diamond hitch? Well, I kind of grew up dad and packing for him and I was, didn't know any different till years later that you wouldn't go to purgatory for tying anything but a diamond. And, uh, we used to laugh at those government packers packing those box tickets. <laughs> Yeah, so it's kind of a, we're pretty much a, use two major hitches, uh, two primary hitches, I should say, the diamond hitch and the box hitch. So this one, we're going to actually do the diamond hitch. Uh, it has a, a lot of uh, capabilities of holding the load down. It also has, uh, pull the loads away from the animals coming under. Uh, also, it helps to secure the top. We uh, we generally always pack all of our mules with a pack cover. It serves multiple purposes. It uh, protects all the gear and equipment underneath. Keeps things dry in a rainstorm. Keeps the dust off in a in a normal uh, dusty day. And it also protects it on fires as well. Okay, all yours, Michael. Uh, Fairly straightforward hitch. Okay. Fairly quick too. Uh, that's pretty much it. We're uh, pretty much uh, done. I mean, that's should hopefully if we balanced our loads and everything weighed out right, we should be able to go all day without having to touch it again. You want to lead her out, Michael? Sure. See if that load hits good. Come on, Abby. Welcome back. That was a wonderful video. And we thank Michael and Lee. And Lee Roser is one of the master packers at the Center of Excellence. Um, that was some wonderful learning about the Sawbuck Saddle. And with that, we're going to go ahead and open it up to questions. Um, I'll go ahead and read what's in the uh, Q&A box. I see somebody just put a question in there. Ah, interesting. I'll let one of the packers grab this one. Where do your mules for the Center of Excellence come from? Go ahead and turn your cameras on and your mic, Ken. Michael. Nobody's jumping in. I'll jump in. This is Michael. Um, we actually uh, put out a purchase order annually, and it's pretty much uh, wherever there's a possibility of getting animals. We uh, A lot of those red mules came out of Tennessee. So we'll get some mules out of Oregon, and we've got mules out of... Uh, um, I'd say pretty much south, southeast, I'd say pretty much in that kind of country. That seems to be where a lot of the mules are. And once in a while, we'll get a meal or two out of you know, California as well. Anybody want to add a little bit to that? And I'll go back to the, is there any more questions that anybody wants to put in the Q&A? Oh, I saw one just pop in there. Sarah, do you train your animals or do you get them trained to pack? 
How do they come? Most of the time up here in Northern California, most of the time we train ours after we get them. Once in a while, we get some that uh, have already been in somebody else's string and they're getting rid of them for, for some reason. But most of the time we train our own. Good. Any other questions out there? Go ahead and give you a minute to think. Again, I put the uh, contact information for the Packers back in your chat in case you want to write down their emails, have some personal conversations after the class if you're interested in some specific aspect of the Center of Excellence. The Center of Excellence, and you, if you were with us Tuesday, you heard this um, and saw some of these Packers. They do have an apprenticeship program at the Region 5 Southwest Pacific Southwest Center of Excellence. Um, and so if you're interested in something like that, you might contact one of the Packers too. Any more questions? If not, we might get out a little bit early, um, but there is some things we wanna do before we call it a wrap. Any more questions? All right. Oh, yep, one more popped in. So from Nick, over the years, what are the most common mistakes that have been made regarding packing efficiencies? That's a hard one. They're all. Well, I'm sorry, I couldn't quite understand that. That so full over, the, over the years that you've packed, are there some common mistakes that are made that cost you efficiency, or maybe that cause wrecks, things like that? What, what if you're if you're young in the trade of packing, what are some of the pitfalls? Maybe what do you avoid? My so, biggest. Oh, go ahead, Ken. <laughs> My biggest uh, thing that I would say is the lack of plan ahead and prepare on, on whatever it is you're trying. Anybody else want to add to that? Um, I'll add to that. You never should assume you know everything. You should always be willing to learn and realize that a lot of the mistakes and accidents that happen are due to human error, not other reasons that we all seem to come up with. But we need to look at ourselves and we need to continue our learning. No matter how many years we've been doing it, you can always learn better, more and, and different ways of doing things. Great answer, Deb. So I don't have any idea the answer to this question. I don't know if anybody does. What are the total number of US Forest Service packers? We might have to look that one up and go on expedition. That's from Pete, of course. <laughs> Thanks, Pete. Pete, do you know? You can go ahead and put it in the chat if you do. He might. Uh, nobody knows. Stump the panel. Okay, we'll have to go on an expedition and look for the answer for that one. I, okay, so Pete, I don't know if you were in our, uh, if you were watched Pack Stock One on Tuesday, um, but I did kind of for the research for that class try to come up with um, how many um, districts and stuff are still using Pack Stock. And so I will count that number and uh, get back to you on in just a minute here. Thanks, Katie. Sounds good. All right, two more questions. Are mules more frightened by things that move or things that don't move? Who wants to grab that one? Well, like we like we said, in, um, the pack stock one can in the uh, stock safety. Uh, presented the idea that that mules uh, and horses are um, animals that get preyed upon in the wild. So um, they are always afraid of, of things that they think uh, want to get them. And they have the fear and the flight mechanism. So um, if anything moves quickly, um, that's a cause for alarm. But at the same time, something that is very unusual in shape or, or um, color or uh, light versus dark can also um, cause them some concern. And I think Ken wants to add to this too. Go ahead, Ken. Yeah, and they are very smart with really good memory. And so if they go in and they see it one way and something has changed when they come back out, they remember that. They are aware of that and that could spook them. All right, we're gonna go to our last question and we'll go right across and I'll call on everybody. They are interested in what your preference for a pack saddle is. So we'll start with Ken. What do you prefer, Ken? 
Well, I use them all depending on what it is that I'm packing on the one hand, but what I prefer and use the most is the Salmon River. And the main reason for that is that britchin on the back. Thank you. Michael, what do you prefer? You know, it depends on the project we're gonna do. A lot of timber projects will use the Dacker, but uh, most of the time it's Sawbuck. And part of the reason for that is most of the crews that we work with are familiar with that. That saddle, so a lot of their equipment and gear that they bring us is designed to be worked with the saw Very good. Deb, what do you think? What's your preference? Um, I'm gonna pretty much echo what Michael just said, uh, packing here in the Sierras. Uh, the saw buck is the most common, although we also look at the load to be packed in and the shape of the animal's back because sometimes a decker might fit a certain animal better than a, a saw buck, but we don't even have uh, a salmon river saddle on our uh, forest. And so it's been very interesting for me to work with the folks up north to get exposed to that method of packing as well. Great, and Katie, what do you prefer? Um, okay, I'm sorry, Michael. Um, I think I prefer the salmon river saddle. And I say that because I originally worked for Michael and Lee on the Inyo. That was my first packing job. So that was with Sawbucks. Um, but since I moved to Northern California, I, uh, I think the Sand River Saddle is a little easier to use um, and a little easier on the mules. Thanks, Katie. So that was a very fun discussion. I wanna thank all of our packers. So many of them uh, couldn't be here because they're busy, but did so much work in the great videos that we saw to teach us so much. I wanna thank Ken and Katie and Eric and Ellen and Karen from um, the Shasta Trinity and Michael and Deborah and Lee from the Inyo. Um, and again, the National Wilderness Institute wants to really thank all of you for putting the time and effort into trying to teach a traditional skill like this through video <laughs> where we could not bring the students to the corrals and the animals as we usually do. We did a great job. Thank you so much.